Thank you for joining today's talk organized by the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS, CIRA, at Yale University. We are an AIDS research center funded, funded by the US National Institute of Mental Health. My name is Dini Arsono. I'm one of the organizers of this event and the coordinator of CIRA's international research program. Today's event um, and seminar will be recorded and the recording and slides will be available at CIRA website, cira.yale.edu in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we would like to invite you to visit uh, our website to access other resources such as subscription to our newsletter called the CIRA eBulletin, information on HIV related supported HIV related research supported by CIRA, implementation science and something relevant to today's talk, the HIV AIDS in humanitarian crisis program. So today's CIRA talk is titled Resilience in HIV and Aging Research in Response to Crisis, Lessons from Ukraine, uh, which will be presented by our esteemed colleagues from the US and Ukraine. Following the presentation, there will be time for a discussion and a Q&A session with audience. Throughout the event, please use the chat function to submit questions and comments, and also to interact with other attendees. And at the end of the talk, uh, please take a moment to share your feedback in a brief survey that will inform our future events and activities. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's talk, Dr. Luke Davis, who is Associate Professor at the Yale School of Public Health and Yale School of Medicine, he is an epidemiologist and a pulmonary critical care physician whose research employs implementation science to improve the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of tuberculosis. At CIRA, Dr. Davis serves as a scientific advisor for the International Research Program and a co-chair of the Yale Global HIV AIDS Research Network, or GARNER. And with that, please welcome Dr. Davis. Thank you so much, Denny, and welcome to everyone who's attending today, especially our presenters. Uh, as many of you know, on December 1st every year, we acknowledge and remember World AIDS Day. And this is one of those events where we get together to try to understand what are the goals that we need to achieve. Uh, we know that inequalities have perpetuated the AIDS epidemic, but they're not inevitable. We can actually tackle them. And that's the theme of World AIDS Day this year, which is Equalize, uh, which is urging each of us to address the inequalities which are holding us back to end AIDS. This uh, slogan or call to action of Equalize is particularly relevant to HIV AIDS and humanitarian crises, uh, which we'll be talking about today uh, as, as we hear from our colleagues who are working in Ukraine to address resilience in HIV and aging research in response to this uh, war in Ukraine and to try to learn some of the lessons there. This is very relevant because with humanitarian crises, we know that wherever people are, they have the same right to achieve and receive uh, evidence-based interventions to, uh, to prevent, uh, treat, and sustain them through their HIV AIDS uh, journey and their, their life living with HIV. Um, I'd like to now introduce our presenters. Uh, um, I'll start first with uh, Dr. Julia Rosanova. Uh, Julia is uh, uh, a uh, Associate Research Scientist in Medicine in the Division of AIDS um, here at the Yale School of Medicine. And she received her PhD in Sociology and trained in Social uh, Gerontology and Implementation Science. And she has been carrying out research at the interface of HIV addiction and aging in Ukraine since 2017. Her work has been widely supported uh, by many foundations and by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, she, uh, Julia is uh, uh, accompanied today by Dr. Sheila Shinoy, who is Associate Professor of Medicine, Infectious Diseases. And uh, Sheila is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the AIDS program in this section. And she conducts clinical research on tuberculosis and HIV AIDS with a focus on research limited settings, uh, including uh, implementation in uh, areas where HIV TB services may be particularly affected, um, such as uh, prisons. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Alexander uh, Zazulin. Um, Alexander is a senior researcher at the European Institute of Public Health Policy in Ukraine and a close collaborator of Dr. Rosanova and Dr. Shinoy. Uh, Dr. Zazulin's uh, interest is focused on the application of implementation science approaches uh, to try to improve uh, access to data and data collection strategies, particularly for hard to reach HIV bridging populations such as HIV infected young women and older um, people uh, with HIV. Uh, next, I'll introduce Dr. Irina Zavrykyuka. 
Dr. Zavruka is a senior researcher also at the European Institute of Public Health Policy in Ukraine. She's a medical doctor uh, with a specialization in anesthesiology, and she um, has used her expertise uh, to try to engage older people with HIV and their caregivers uh, and understand the effects of HIV and aging. She's a co-investigator on two grants funded by the National Institutes of Aging and the National Institutes uh, of Mental Health. Um, she's particularly interested in peer navigation and decision aid interventions. And then uh, last, uh, but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tatiana Kiryazova. Uh, Kiryazova. Uh, Dr. Kiryazova is, is uh, a graduate of the Odessa National University where she got her uh, PhD degree in neurophysiology. Um, and she is an expert in HIV, TB and addictions in Ukraine and internationally, and has done fellowships uh, in the US at Boston Medical Center um, and at Emory. Um, we're so pleased to uh, have this uh, great team today. And I'll turn it over now to, uh, to the team to uh, introduce their presentation. Uh, just a reminder, um, as they share their slides that we uh, welcome discussion. We'll have some questions at the end. So please insert your questions into the chat. Thank you so much. Um, look, thank you, Dr. Davis. That's a very gracious introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me fine? Yeah, okay, great. So um, would you like me to share the screen? How would uh, the logistics go? Yes, you can share the screen, Julia. Okay, so let me just um, bear with me a second. And I need to somehow start the slideshow. Okay, so hopefully you see what I'm seeing here as well. Yeah, okay, great. Perfect. So we will um, take turns to deliver our um, thoughts to you today. And um, please bear with us because technically we are doing our best given that uh, some of our colleagues are in Ukraine and uh, the situation with internet and electricity might be a little bit um, dynamic. But also I would like to um, thank very much our Ukrainian colleagues who joined this uh, presentation today um, and also uh, Dr. Alena Nesterova. Um, who is a colleague of Dr. Zizulens um, from the Center for Public Health in Ukraine. Um, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. And also our longstanding colleague, Miroslava Filipovich, who is also um, a colleague working at the uh, European Institute on Public Health Policy. So um, the presentation today um, also owes its visuals and structure to our colleague Alexandra Diak, and I would like to acknowledge her input here. So we will uh, first very briefly um, give you a flavor of um, the um, setting and background where we conduct our research. Um, we'll talk with you about how our work has evolved what we have found first and how we use that to um, make um, a program of research around some of those questions that emerged and um, secure some funding support for that. Uh, we will give you a very brief flavor of our three um, key uh, NIH funded projects that are ongoing in Ukraine right now. And then we would also spend most of our time talking about the um, um, uh, the way that our colleagues and ourselves work during the crisis in Ukraine, what we have used to um, adapt to this crisis, and some findings that um, we um, have already discovered. We will also reflect on some uh, challenges and uh, approaches to overcome those challenges and lessons that we learned during this process that we believe are important not just in humanitarian settings, but also during peace. And then we'll um, share with you some of the uh, work that is um, also going a little bit beyond this uh, particular research program, but is connected to that, some, some charity that we have become involved with. And then we hopefully will have some time for um, Q&A. So this is a photograph um, that was taken last year, um, just over a year ago. And you can see here uh, many of us. So you can see myself and Sheila and uh, Alexander Zizulin and Tatiana and Irina, and also a lot of clinicians who we have been working with in Ukraine. 
And our team has also included um, a lot of people over time who um, became like family. So it's like an extended primary family. And I hope that I have uh, acknowledged everyone um, in this list of close collaborators and colleagues. So uh, now I'm going to um, um, pass it over to Sheila, who will say a few words about the, uh, um, the setting and what we have um, started from. Sheila, over to you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone, for having us today. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to share our experiences, um, particularly with our colleagues from Ukraine who are here. Um, so just briefly, um, like many uh, resource-limited settings that have um, struggled during the last few years, um, the setup to this particular year in Ukraine um, is a result of multiple crises, um, including COVID-19, um, against a background of a raging um, HIV epidemic, a raging uh, tuberculosis epidemic, addiction, mental health care, all of these together uh, forming a syndemic um, background, um, and then introduce um, the war that started in February. Um, so Ukraine has over 360,000 people with HIV. Um, as part of our work, uh, focusing on older people with HIV defined as those uh, 50 years and older, um, about a quarter of uh, all cases um, in Ukraine are among older people with HIV. Um, these, these, this particular segment is highly marginalized uh, by the intersecting um, epidemics of HIV, addiction, um, and also ageism. Um, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that depression is highly comorbid with HIV and substance use. Um, this is just uh, the background against uh, which the war comes upon and has exacerbated all of these epidemics. Um, the ultimate goal of, of our work is to facilitate improved outcomes amongst uh, older people with HIV. So going with the 90-90-90, um, you know, is to improve um, overall healthy living. Um, and Julia has, has emphasized um, throughout all this work, um, improving quality of life and as, as part of the fourth 90 as well. So it's important for us to keep in mind in our work. Next slide. It has frozen on me for some reason a little bit, so. Oh. So give me one second. Um, I'll just stop sharing for a sec and then I'll see if I can move the slide. I'm sorry. Um, sometimes I think. That's okay, Julia. And I can also sh share my screen if that's. Um, okay, well, I, I was able to move the slide when I unshared, but I'm not sure what's um, sort of going on. So if you do, that would be nice. Okay. Um, right now on slide five. Yeah. That would be great. Okay. Then I would worry about freezing. Oh. So, and um, while we're at it, um, so it's slide five. Yeah, there's a like a prompt. Can you see or do you see my uh, yeah, presenter see slide? Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Denny, could you just swap the uh, slideshow yeah, screen? Thanks. I want to swap. Uh, okay, I present a few. Mm. Display setting at the top. Oh, it's right. being hidden under. <laughs> Yeah. How about now? Perfect. Good. This oh, one? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay, so um, we have uh, had quite an evolution in our work. And um, so that all started with just the seed idea. And um, I, um, given that my training has been in social gerontology, 
uh, have been intrigued by the growing um, numbers of new HIV diagnosis among older adults that I just heard about um, from colleagues in Ukraine, uh, but there was no research into that at the time. And um, I talked with Sheila about that, and she actually was the only person who listened at the time and who you know, paid the slightest attention to what I was saying and showed interest. And so that's kind of like how we began. And we are so grateful to CIRA because they gave us this first um, breakthrough that we really needed uh, by supporting our pilot project, uh, HIV and Aging in Ukraine. And uh, so that um, was a boost of morale to us, but also it gave us the much needed resources to start some pilot and formative work, um, doing interviews with older adults and with uh, the clinicians and to find out what this journey um, has been for um, people to be diagnosed with HIV and to cope with this diagnosis. So we um, then had um, support from Macmillan Foundation um, for some work around gender and around stigma. And uh, then we also started a relationship with FLAGS, um, which is the um, Fund for Lesbian and Gay Studies at Yale. And uh, we have uh, continued this formative work doing focus groups and doing interviews. And we collected the information for what we thought was a good proposal for NIH, but we were rejected. So nobody was interested. It just did not um, get calibrated well. And so we had quite a few rounds of rejections. Um, and the most painful round came in 2020 because um, at that time, um, there was a lot of uncertainty around just about everything. And um, I remember how we were um, very focused on trying to find this nuance that would give us the sort of this, this advantage vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis other groups who were also competing for funding. And we were not getting that. But we just kept going. And I think that what we did back then and how much we have um, struggled to get over those barriers was really a blessing in disguise because it helped us to to learn how we can emotionally deal with um, lots of failures and how we can work together as a team, despite not ha having positive affirmations for a long time. And uh, I think that that um, gave us the creativity that we really um, find our defining feature in, in our teamwork, uh, finding creative solutions, finding some ways to present ideas in a creative way. And I think that also ultimately that helps to reach um, the goals that we, um, um, we, we described. So we finally uh, found this way of um, uh, presenting our um, our work um, in the cogent manner. Um, and uh, we received funding for our study post. And um, we continued our efforts to understand how older adults with HIV were dealing with COVID pandemic and continuing our survey that became longitudinal over time, continued qualitative work uh, in Ukraine among older adults and their caregivers and their clinicians. And then when the war started, um, we um, felt that there was a need to uh, bring in this component of the war and how people were adjusting and coping into the uh, ongoing work. And so that um, uh, brought to fruition the um, administrative supplement to our PROST study. And uh, then Parada was born. And Parada is um, a project to deal with decision aids um, for HIV status disclosure with um, for older adults with HIV. And we'll um, tell you a little bit more about those uh, studies um, in just a moment. And the next slide, Dini, please. And now I would like Sheila to comment on uh, our initial findings that helped us to develop um, those subsequent applications. Thank you, Julia. So just to briefly summarize um, the work that we were able to do with support from CIRA, with support from Macmillan, um, FLAGS and others, um, and that led us to um, ultimately be funded by NIH and to scale up our work. Um, so we did uh, perform these several studies. Um, as in, Julia mentioned um, that there was, um, our colleagues noticed that there was um, some trends um, amongst older adults living with HIV. Um, and we were able to um, evaluate that and characterize that a little bit more. And we were able to document the significant increase um, of older adults among HIV incident cases. And also we were able to demonstrate that 
older adults um, with HIV experienced um, significantly increased mortality compared to the age matched general population. Um, so that was a very important first step um, to demonstrating that this was an important area to um, examine. Um, we also did a retrospective assessment of older adults with HIV compared to younger adults with HIV in the uh, Odessa uh, HIV clinic. Um, and we demonstrated amongst 400 patients that older adults presented um, to care with significantly lower CD4 counts, uh, nearly half had AIDS at diagnosis, um, they had more comorbidities than younger adults. They were also almost 50% less likely to initiate ART at all, and um, three, more than three and a half times more likely to be lost to follow-up, all consistent with a picture of four outcomes. We were also able to conduct qualitative interviews, interviews with patients, um, older patients living with HIV, who described um, being diagnosed with HIV as a traumatic event that really challenged um, their self-image and their identity um, as a person um, 50 years and older who'd lived most of their life in a certain way. And it's really challenged um, their notion of self. Um, they reported a high level of perceived stigma, including amongst um, personal contacts, including amongst families, um, that was challenging to manage. And interestingly, um, um, within that notion of stigma, they, um, for the most part, noted a very trusting relationship with their, not only their HIV doctor and the HIV clinic staff, um, but were still very reluctant to disclose their diagnosis to others um, outside of their family, if they had even disclosed to their family, um, but also even to their other um, clinicians, um, including primary care doctors. Um, which was um, startling. Um, that level of trust, that level of perceived stigma was there. Um, and so they may be seeing other doctors and not um, revealing their HIV diagnosis. Um, and then um, I think Julia was gonna go into more detail about this, but we, at the, in 2020, um, uh, after the start of COVID, uh, we quickly were able to mobilize and um, speak with uh, a number of older adults with HIV using telehealth um, and found that for the most part, there was a lot of concern and anxiety regarding able, being able to continue with their chronic HIV care. Um, but for the most part, people were able to maintain um, being on antiretroviral therapy and with, with little disruption. And that's largely through the um, Herculean efforts of the um, HIV clinic um, staff. Um, and the other big note from that assessment was that people noted how important social support was to them. The patients identified social support as a key ingredient to moving forward um, at a very difficult time um, at the start of the COVID pandemic. So all of these studies were very informative to identifying and characterizing um, the uh, barriers that older adults with HIV faced um, and led us to think about next steps. How can we address these? How can we learn more? How can we identify potential um, solutions or facilitators to people um, continuing in HIV care so that we can improve their outcomes? And I'll turn it over to the next slide. Thank you so much, Sheila. So just um, to give you um, a little bit of um, flavor of our three uh, key projects, um, they are PROST, PROST War, and PORADA. So PROST is an abbreviation and uh, it translates as peer run optimal support for treatment. And it's also a word that is used uh, as a toast in Ukraine and other countries in Eastern Europe. And it means to your health. Um, so the goal here is to adapt a peer navigation intervention for out-of-care older adults with HIV. And uh, it involves a two-arm pilot RC team with 90 out-of-care um, older persons with HIV, 60 of whom are going to be in prost arm and 30 in the treatment as usual arm. So currently we are uh, we have just finished the um, uh, part where we adapted the um, intervention. 
the training manual has been prepared, the training itself um, has been done and there was a dry run. And so currently we're recruiting the um, older adults with HIV um, as peer navigators. And um, also we have had the um, uh, meetings and consultations with um, doctors in Ukraine in terms of the um, uh, recruitment of 90 participants. And that's going to be feasible. Alexander has, has led this work. So the supplement to this work <clears throat> is um, um, piggybacking on the um, survey that we have conducted since the beginning of COVID. So it's going to be the fifth wave, um, which we hope to start fielding in January uh, 2023. And originally we had a sample of 123 older adults and uh, we um, have observed their dynamics in terms of their mental health, their participation in care, their um, it's self-reported, um, but it's um, it's been using the uh, validated uh, measures uh, for depression uh, symptoms, for anxiety, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, um, and also alcohol use, um, uh, any kind of uh, activity involving drug use, um, and also their healthy behaviors and how they're encountering stressors during the war. Um, so we ran uh, the fourth wave just after the war started. So that was done in April um, this year. And we will uh, want to see how people were adapting or adjusting or not. And uh, we will use those findings to inform our PROST intervention. And then our third project is called PORADA, which is also an abbreviation. And it stands for Pursuing Optimal Results Over Aging Via Decision Aid. And PORADA is a Ukrainian word that means advice. Um, and uh, the uh, goal there is to adapt a paper-based decision aid brochure for uh, HIV status disclosure um, to older adults with HIV in Ukraine. And so they wouldn't be uh, forced to make a disclosure. The goal is not to increase disclosures per se, but to increase disclosures with a successful outcome, which means that people will not regret their decision afterwards and that this decision to disclose their HIV status to somebody will be more likely than not to bring a supportive reaction rather than a stigmatizing reaction. So that uh, work is just starting and uh, we are currently doing formative um, work for that. And now I would like to hand it over to my colleague Alexander who will um, talk about um, the ways we have been doing this work. Alexander, over to you. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, uh, since I'm from Ukraine, I, I would like to <laughs> clarify if you can hear me, because just uh, five minutes ago, I had a blackout and internet, and internet was absent. So I will take, uh, I will do my best to do my presentation as fast as possible, because anytime we can lose uh, a connection. So uh, I have two slides in this presentation, and I, uh, the, the, the goal of the first slide is to explain how do we work in these conditions which we are now. And um, uh, I briefly describe approaches what we are using to keep up with all the demanding aims uh, and activities uh, in our projects. Uh, so uh, intellectual institutions uh, are often the first targets when war uh, started and uh, Many public health professionals who work in Kiev and other territory, territories suffered from the invasion uh, and leave the country or move to the safer, safer places in Ukraine. Uh, despite the war, uh, the work on our research project was not interrupted. During the time outside of our typical worker, working context, uh, we reformatted our schedules and technical approaches and uh, this allowed us to continue uh, working on our ongoing projects. Uh, for this, our uh, team developed specific crisis plans to keep our project uninterrupted. Our first priority is the personal safety, health and informational information hygiene. We have to keep our uh, mental health in good shape. We have to avoid reading harmful news and we have to concentrate on the work and this are the rule because uh, this is uh, vital in order to be productive and to um, keep delivering the results and uh, preserve our functionality 
for not only for work but for our families and for for our country the second we reorganized our uh, everyday life to be more flexible given blackouts and internet outages we prepare usually the base for our offline work while there is internet and electricity usually we download uh, download online content on our hard drives to work on battery when there is no power once power is back we upload our work done during the outage to cloud services to sell uh, to save all our outputs uh, the third way we use distant modalities for project management to the extent possible we work with our local partners on computer-based approaches to push the digitalization of study procedures up to 100 percent and uh, luckily ukraine is the country with the most um, fast progress in terms of internet coverage and the uh, internet is still uh, the service which is the cheapest service uh, among the um, close by uh, European countries we have um, the cheapest internet in the area I believe and the fastest by the way in addition we developed hybrid approach uh, where we apply online tools and cloud-based platforms along with the paper-based documentation in case internet is not available fourth uh, ways to work way, way to work in our uh, setting is uh, we shifted working hours to early mornings mornings or weekends and weekends or and weekends when traditionally there are outages window uh, to complete our uh, task usually tasks usually saturday and sundays uh, have a, a list of some outages so we use this opportunity to keep up with our working plans uh, since the february 24 during the most stressful times uh, our social and professional networks have been expanded and restructured uh, most efficient connections remain and we obtained many new connections and these new connections even more productive than we had before so those the most resilient stayed uh, in place and uh, continue to work uh, continue to work with us and in addition we obtained many more uh, connections while doing um, volunteer work and ukrainian army support so it uh, really um, positively impacted our professional work and the last but not least, we secured results-based communication with our donors and international colleagues with regular updates on the local context uh, where uh, when we are discussing and agree, agreeing on the implementation plans and in crisis settings. Uh, we provide regular information and we keep this information exchange and timely and that allows us to timely restructure our working plans, protocols and procedures uh, which is essential in preserving research project conduct. Uh, now I would like to describe the um, results of our uh, latest investigation, which is go into the paper and paper is in process of, sub, uh, of um, reviewing. It was submitted. Uh, uh, Sasha, it actually, the news came, it was published today. Oh, so I didn't yeah. have time to update. So it is 2022. Yeah, it is a surprise. Um, I didn't know about that. So. Yeah, yeah, it just came this morning. So it's been published. So congratulations. Okay. Congratulations to all the team. Great work. Uh, I will briefly uh, discuss uh, the results. So we conducted a cross sectional phone survey among older people with HIV between April and June 2020 and we recruited uh, 123 respondents of which 63 were uh, women we found that 12% uh, were detected to have suicidal ideation also 45% uh, of respondents uh, had symptoms of moderate and uh, and severe depression uh, moderate uh, moderate or severe depression 35% were detected to have generalized anxiety disorder and 28% participants uh, of participants had symptoms of both anxiety and depression. 70% uh, had at least one comorbidity in addition to their HIV infection. Also, we asked the participants about their preferences regarding peer support and we found out that majority 
about 60% of them expressed the willingness to provide peer support to other older people with HIV. Uh, further, uh, I provide short summary on our findings. Uh, we observed that uh, perceived barriers on HIV care and uh, self-reported substance use were associated with higher level of depression and anxiety during the lockdown. Our findings suggest that there is a need for tailored proactive uh, intervention uh, for older people uh, with HIV and these people, this particular uh, population category should participate in each stage of public health response development, especially in crisis context uh, via format like um, community advisory board or uh, joint working groups which are close to Ministry of Health or other, um, other places where discussion is taking place. In the future, we will strive to conduct the, the studies on mental health effects of COVID-19 and other health-related aspects of older people with HIV in crisis context. We also will propose the research to explore whether peers can strengthen HIV and mental health outcomes in older people with HIV during crisis. So this is probably it. And I will um, pass the word to Julia. Thank you. And I believe uh, next is Irina. We conducted a small quality study in March, April of uh, 2022. Uh, this were uh, deep interviews with providers and patients, uh, uh, HIV positive people, uh, 50 plus age, uh, briefly about the results. Key uh, themes uh, from uh, HIV and uh, addiction providers. First, uh, first uh, HIV status disclosure to receive help with accessing RT during the war. To receive help with accessing RT in the context of war, some uh, um, OPWH disclosed their HIV status uh, to relatives for the first time and also had to disclose their HIV status uh, in strangers uh, medical facilities with, uh, with a forced relocation. Uh, to uh, seem, um, unlike many younger patients, most uh, um, older uh, people with HIV stayed in Kyiv and did not uh, evacuate. Reasons included uh, impaired uh, mobility, fear of the unknown, uh, lack of financial and other resources needed for evacuation, emotional uh, attachment to home, uh, caregiving uh, responsibilities and or a vision to stay close to their trusted HIV and other healthcare providers. Um, the sort uh, theme, um, the war uh, disrupted normalcy uh, but uh, produced uh, uh, over uh, helming uh, solidarity and uh, mutual support. HIV care uh, continued uh, through uh, indignity and uh, uh, sacrifice by clinicians. Uh, while uh, clinics lost half of uh, frontal personnel who evacuated uh, Romanian clinicians worked um, intensively to accommodate uh, all patients and, and, uh, performed, uh, and performed additional tasks, including custodial to assist uh, internally displaced patients and provide uh, psychological post-trauma uh, uh, counseling. Uh, key seems uh, uh, from um, older people with HIV patients. Uh, uh, the first uh, theme, uh, the social psychological uh, uh, consequences of the possible or real uh, destruction of houses of, old, uh, of older people with HIV during the war. All respondents had a real 
um, existing frightening uh, threat of uh, such a situation. It is well known that um, due to significantly uh, um, uh, weakened health, uh, most HIV positive patients are disabled or have limited opportunities. It is virtually impossible to imagine that treatment, care, and social support of such patients in the um, absence of normal individual housing for such patients. The fear of leaving your home uh, is perhaps the greatest fear of all uh, respons uh, respondents. Uh, the second uh, uh, theme, uh, problems of uh, maintaining health, uh, continuing RT of therapy and treatment uh, as a whole uh, in work conductions. An interview analysis also showed what was concerned about HIV infected patients. Uh, um, uh, it was access to RT. As you know, HIV infected patients must be regularly all life to take RT, um, antiretroviral drugs, and such drugs are not sold in pharmacies. The experiments of um, medication avail uh, availability for the treatment of comorbidities were also so. And the third theme, uh, psychological support, uh, treatment and prevention of post-traumatic syndrome in uh, older people with HIV. Most of the respondents uh, survived. Uh, psychological support, uh, support what was provided at the beginning of the war by children, relatives, friends, uh, volunteers, but it was only the beginning. As one of the uh, providers uh, said, we still need to solve emotional problems for a long time. How to get back to our normal mental state as well as how to get rid of anger and uh, hatred. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, Preparing this slide, I wanted to say uh, that the medical system does not stop. Thanks to this, we can perform our activities as researchers. I included uh, quarters from uh, providers who say a lot in the slide. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has hardened uh, us to respond to the provision of such a, uh, such, uh, sociological research and uh, in war conditions. Many of the tools that we implemented in the COVID-19 pandemic mode, uh, we are now implementing during the war. For example, a distance collection of data by phone, Zoom, Viber, etc. Uh, this is especially important now. Uh, when patients moved uh, to other reg regions of Ukraine uh, or to other countries. Uh, the continuous uh, workflow of our research has provided uh, not only financial support, but also psychologically helped research staff uh, survive uh, life crisis. Therefore, it was important from uh, the beginning of the pandemic until today to continue to work and uh, provide staff with jobs as much as possible. Julia. Thank you very much, Irina. Um, next slide, please, Ginny. So I would uh, just uh, say a few personal insights that to me became quite important because my colleagues have already um, said so uh, articulately what we have learned. But something that 
you know, to me stands out, and I would like to add that to the mix. So one thing is that um, our research, and uh, I think everyone's research, needs to be built on love, not money. And it's very important because otherwise you can't survive the crisis. So both when it's very hard to get going and when um, life gives you all kinds of horrible scenarios to get through. If you don't believe in what you're doing, it's very easy just to give up because there are so many other things that you can be doing instead of this. So you can only do what we are doing um, if you are crazily in love with this work. And um, also in doing so, you have to um, have solid relationships with your colleagues and only work with decent people who you truly admire, which is um, a blessing for, for our team. And these people need to be extremely reliable. And I think that this is demonstrated. It can be a better demonstration than what our colleagues are doing today. So it's very hard for them to be here and they're here. And so that's what we try to do. You know, we just try to be each other's rock and, um, you know, um, deliver, um, do our best to come together, to deliver, to do this work, to have regular meetings. And if we promise that we will do something, we get it done. It's just as simple as that. And we also have to be very strategic and careful in putting resources to good use and not waste our effort, not spin the wheels. We don't have a lot of time. And uh, also during this very difficult dark time, we have to be very careful in not you know, fighting the wrong battles and not locking horns unnecessarily in not wasting our energy. So we always say yes, but only to real opportunities, to things that we intuitively and based on our collective experience believe have a chance to, to bear some good fruit. And also we have to learn how to be uh, patient and learn how to wait. We have learned, started learning that during this long period of rejections by NIH and well, every other possible um, agency on the face of the earth where we were supporting one another as team members and clinicians with whom we were working in Ukraine um, were giving us that support because they believed in us. It's very difficult to keep this team of the size when you don't have the money. But we managed to do that, you know, for over three years until we finally were funded. Why? Because these people were there not for money, not for what a consultancy fee we could give them, but for love, because they thought that the ideas we were developing were exciting, were worthwhile, and were extremely important. And so they were willing to invest their time in um, being patient, continuing with us, you know, to develop those ideas, to write those papers, to apply for those grants, you know, to fight those wars ultimately, like literally and figuratively, because they thought that, you know, it's worth the wait. And because they believed, and we believed with them, that uh, sooner or later, um, it will come to fruition. And so our team, I think, is bigger than the sum of its parts. So there is some kind of collective effervescence between all of us where, you know, each individual person brings their input. We are truly blessed uh, to work together. Um, and I'm so grateful and honored, you know, to, um, to be given a chance to lead this amazing group of people. And our um, motto in a way um, is onwards and upwards, or if there is a will, there is a way. So we do believe that if you follow your heart, um, you will um, be able to do some good work. Uh, and if this work leads you through humanitarian settings, you will have to weather that storm. And being in this together makes us feel warmer, make, makes us feel safer. And uh, we also feel the support that you all gave to us to um, listen to our thoughts and uh, spend this time with us for which we're truly grateful. So the next slide, please. And Irina, if you could just share um, some of uh, things that we have done on the side. Sorry, Julia, do you want me to share the links to the chat? You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, uh, Ira, my, my, click, my click link. Link. Uh, uh, 
Dini, yeah, you, if you can just try to click one of those links to oh, open up. I, the... my, может быть в интернете, maybe uh, to uh, internet. I don't think I can do that for now because I'm on full screen, but I can post this into the chat if I stop sharing. Okay, okay. Um, you can stop sharing because uh, this okay. is, um, it's, it's a nice collage of uh, drawings, so it might be nice. Um, Ira can describe that and then um, in the meanwhile, you can, you know, bring it to life or try. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, can I uh, see a slide? Hold on, I would. I will try to share the link into the chat right now. So this is the. Okay. Can I can I talk uh, about competitions? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, it's our little pride. <laughs> Uh, the research team uh, organized uh, and uh, conducted uh, within our projects uh, two children's uh, uh, drawing uh, contacts. Uh, uh, elderly people and coronavirus in uh, 2020 and elderly, uh, elderly people uh, and the war in Ukraine uh, in 2022. Uh, these are Mm, charity events. Uh, the competitions uh, that allowed uh, the younger generation to support all Ukrainians uh, and uh, especially the elderly uh, in uh, connection with today's uh, realities, uh, in uh, connection with the uh, COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic and the war in Ukraine. Uh, these competitions were evaluated by an independent commission. Uh, uh, there were gifts, prizes. I recommended contacting uh, the website of our institute and enjoy children's drawings. Uh, on the slide, um, uh, I chose uh, a drawing of the smallest participants, three years old. Uh, this is the winner in the category the worst coronavirus, and the second drawing of the uh, 15 years old winner in the competition. But, uh, uh, ah, okay. Uh, okay, one, two, three, four, six, uh, seven, eight, eight. Uh, 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 drawing uh, is um, the smallest uh, participant uh, uh, in the uh, competition. Uh, uh, competition um, uh, elderly people and coronavirus. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, the second. Uh, as you see, the second uh, drawing uh, uh, of a 15-year-old winner in the uh, competition uh, elderly people and the war in Ukraine in 2022. Julia? Yeah, so... Um... I uh, find that these drawings are extremely beautiful and they also are, I cry when I, when I see them. And uh, I think that this is just one example where art is therapeutic and um, it both captures the pain, but it also gives this um, creative resolution to the pain where something beautiful can come from, I'm sorry, from a lot of suffering. And we are very grateful that we were able to um, get a little bit of resources to help uh, to support those young artists and their families. So we hope that we brought a little bit of joy to these uh, families and to these communities. So I'm truly grateful for that. And um, this is about it. Now, uh, we just want to thank the audience for patiently listening to us and invite them to ask questions. Thank you so much, Julia. And uh, thank you also, uh, Alexander and Julia and Sheila. This was a extremely inspiring uh, presentation. I think we heard about uh, the, the power of your research kind of with older adults 
throughout the HIV epidemic, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and then of course the effects of the war. Uh, I really was inspired by the strategies and the sources of your resilience and continuing your research that was quite moving. And this is a wonderful example of community engagement in terms of the art contest. I think uh, really um, very moving as, as you say. Um, there's a few questions that are coming now into the chat. Um, so uh, just for time, I'll go ahead and read them. Um, uh, Mercedes uh, mentions that your work is inspiring and heartwarming. A question that she has is the PRO study, um, what is your definition of out of care for people living with HIV, uh, older people living with HIV? So we have been discussing, thank you so much for a kind words and for the question. So we have been discussing um, which definition would be the best to use. And we so far are using the standard definition. So these are people who have been diagnosed with HIV, but either never started their care, and it's already been over seven days since their diagnosis, or they can be um, diagnosed earlier, but for the last 90 days, they have not um, been taking ART uh, and uh, how we check on that, that's that's another story. So we look at various strategies, but it's the 90 days um, sort of interruption if they were prescribed the ART. So that's our definition at the moment. Thanks. And there's a comment from uh, Kaveh Kushnud saying what an inspiring presentation, uh, what amazing work is being done uh, in the midst of an ongoing conflict. Um, maybe a kind of a broader question for, for you, Yulia and uh, Arena and Alexander and Sheila, which is, you know, what do you see ahead? You all have been so resilient and adaptable to the different challenges. What, what, what are um, the things that kind of concern you most as you, as you head into this winter uh, in Ukraine facing the war? Um, are there any silver linings in, in terms of your research going forward? Um, it'd be great to hear that. Um, Sasha, Ira, I think maybe first, if you can say something. Uh, so our uh, like big, biggest concern, I think our all biggest concern uh, have been in the past already, I think, because uh, the Ukraine uh, demonstrated uh, good resilience. The system was uh, uh, was uh, stressed, but now it's stable, and we show uh, that we can adjust to various asp various you know problems, and um, we got belief good belief in ourselves and uh, we got first of all we have strong belief and uh, evidence of the strongest support ever and we feel this support every day and once we have this support we will uh, be able to keep with any aspect of our life like defending our country defending our research and as long as we have this support um we have this belief and uh, uh, so far, uh, given that uh, there is no sign of any abate in terms of support, uh, our confidence is solid. So I hope this is the this is the answer for the question. Thanks, Sasha. Ira, do you have something to add? Uh, Ира, у вас микрофон. Юля, Юля, maybe translate um, uh, question. Да, конечно. Um, uh, вопрос сам. Uh, что может быть хорошего, как бы какие уроки позитивные мы можем извлечь, uh, ну как бы по преодолению, что мы видим в будущем на перспективу нашей работы. Вот как бы мы надеемся, кризис пройдет, вот и что у нас будет впереди, что мы хорошего ждем впереди. Исходя из нашей работы, имеется в виду, вот уроков, которые мы извлекли, исследования, которые мы проводим, вот в таком плане. Что мы хорошего ждем впереди? Во-первых, мы ждем окончания всего этого ужаса, и после окончания этого ужаса мы хотим вернуться к нормальной жизни, к нормальной работе. Вот, и адаптировать все то, что наработано в данный момент 
в условиях кризиса, я имею в виду в условиях пандемии, в условиях войны, адаптировать все наши наработки уже в нормальной реальной жизни. Вот. И самое главное сейчас, если, да, если брать сейчас, то это продолжать работу в тех условиях, в которых мы находимся. Если я правильно поняла вопрос. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, thank you so much, Irina. So Irina said that, of course, we'll all look forward to the war um, being stopped, coming to an end, and peace um, coming once again, and uh, people healing, people returning to normal life, um, rebuilding. And uh, for us um, to learn from what we have done during the war um, and working hard to reduce the pain, um, you know, to still accomplish our, our goal of um, allowing people with HIV who are older to live a long, happy and healthy life, um, the fourth 90. So this goal is not changed. Uh, it just is taking us a little longer to, to arrive there, but we believe that that's what we will be uh, will be continuing to do. Uh, I'll also call on Sheila now, but uh, before I do that, we also have a practical, um, uh, believe it or not, a practical answer to your question, um, Luke, because we are working on a special issue of a journal in Frontiers of Public Health that is dedicated to um, the crisis and what happens post-crisis. It has a specific focus on addiction system, but HIV and addiction are intertwined, um, like CME's um, twins, And so everybody's invited. I'll put the um, um, link into the chat just now, or Alexandra, if you hear me, you can put the link into the chat. Um, and everybody is invited uh, very cordially to explore this link and to see if they would like to uh, join us on this initiative to exactly explore what happens after a crisis, what lessons can be learned through a crisis, from a crisis that can apply after a crisis is a new normal that comes up once, um, uh, thank you, Alexandra, um, once the dust settles, um, is it in some way better than what life used to be before, you know, before the crisis, before COVID, before the war, um, and in which ways? And so we hope that we will collectively um, catalyze this discussion because unfortunately crisis and wars and various kinds of bad things repeatedly happen in the world. And so we hope that this effort will also not be wasted, but uh, will scientifically and socially bring us um, to a better future together. But first, we also have to survive, just stay alive and stay well. Well, I and think so, I just want... Oh. Sorry, I, I, I also wanted to ask, sorry, Luke, I just wanted yeah. to ask, Sheila has some. Sure, sure, uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Julia. Um, I think our colleagues from um, you know, again, Alexander and Rina have, have really um, said it beautifully. We're grateful for our collaboration and our uh, friendships. Um, we are hopeful that uh, our colleagues remain safe um, and that our patients um, are able to continue to move forward. And um, of course, thankful that NIH has continued to support the work. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations. Uh, I appreciate all the attendees and especially our presenters. I think Denny will just close us with a few words. Yes, thank you, Luke. And thank you everyone uh, for the presenters, especially for taking the time during your busy days and uh, you know um, difficult time to participate and presenting your work. It's, there, it's very inspiring. And I would just like to invite everyone to take a moment to uh, complete a brief survey that you will get as soon as you close the Zoom uh, chat and the Zoom uh, meeting room. And I wish everyone stay safe and well, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful holidays wherever you are. Thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you so much. Thank you.